Welcome to the Title Talk Podcast, an interview series featuring key individuals doing innovative things with their business and life. And now, here's your host, Richard Barbara. Said, my name is Rich Barbara. I'm a real estate lawyer in town. Um, I've been practicing for <laughs> almost 15 years. Feels weird saying that because I feel like just yesterday I graduated, but you know, time flies when uh, when you're having fun, as they say. Um, and and I've done a lot of real estate. So when I was asked to be here today, um, it was a great opportunity for me because number one, how many people here are real estate agents? All of you, right? Okay, and so these are, you're all an opportunity for me to develop a relationship, right? I firmly believe in what Josh was saying about um, developing relationships. That's what this business is all about. Okay? It's about relationships and it's about performance. Okay, so my talk is gonna be about um, why deals fall apart. Okay, why deals fall apart after You've already done a lot of the hard and free work, right? Hard and free work. So why do I say free work? You know, because deals usually, like a deal that falls apart in the negotiation phase where you never get into a contract, nobody really considers that a deal, right? That was a lead, it was a potential deal, but a deal is a deal that makes it into contract and then, for whatever reason, does not close. My video professional would be upset that I'm not standing in front of the camera, but I hate standing in, in one spot, so I'll try harder, sorry. Um, so a deal that doesn't make it to the finish line for whatever reason, okay? That's a deal on which we worked for free. And I was explaining to someone the other day on the phone, I go, you know what never happens in my business? Let me tell you what never happens. I never get a call after a deal dies from a buyer or a seller, right, or an agent, or a lender, or anyone, to say, hey, I'm sorry this deal died, but man, you guys really put in a lot of work. Uh, what do I owe you, right? Has that ever happened for you, right? Have you ever had a seller who like changes their mind, right? They're not really in breach of their listing agreement. Let's say property just doesn't sell, and they're like, hey, I appreciate you showing the house 87 times and baking cookies until you were blue in the face. Can I reimburse you some cookies? Yeah, like never in life, right? <laughs> and so, so since we are in the work for free, Team, we are on the, and I, and I do mean we, and, and when I say we, who do I mean? I mean the real estate lawyer that's doing the closing, right? So you heard Jesus reference Coral Gables title and escrow to title company I've had. The title company has not been open since 2006, but I've been closing real estate transactions with Jesus since 2006. We opened the title company a few years back when I, when I left my, my prior firm. That's neither here nor there, but the real estate lawyer that's closing the file or the closing agent, they are also with you on the we work for free until closing boat, okay? <laughs> they also advance funds in anticipation of a closing, right? We advance estoppels, we advance all kinds of money, title search fees that we incur, lien search fees, they're billing me, they're not billing the seller, okay? So we incur these fees, irrespective of, what, of whether a file closes, okay? Nobody reimburses us. So when I give these presentations to agents, I wanna drive the point home that your closing agent is on your team. If you are working with a closing agent, this is shameless plug time, that you don't feel is necessarily on your team and that the closing agent doesn't realize that they're in the same boat, though we only get paid if the file closes boat, you may be working with the wrong closing agent. Right. Okay, because my philosophy is that if I have to smother grenades to get to the file to closing, I will do that because I'd rather get hit with a little shrapnel than not make money and work for free. Okay, so, and, and in my prior life, I was a litigator. You know what that means? That means, get this, get this. That means that I actually understand the difference between the adversarial setting and the transactional setting. Some lawyers only have ever done real estate, and so you, you get on the phone with them and they're like, you know, put up your dukes on the transaction. And it's like, my man, you do realize that the buyer and the seller want the same thing, right? The deal right. to close right. Okay, imagine a setting where the guy that, uh, on the other side wants the express opposite of what you do. Can you imagine the express opposite? Okay, so deals fall apart largely for one primary reason, right? The agents are unprepared. 
the agents are unprepared. Okay, and so my objective in giving these talks to agents, and I do it with frequency, okay, is to help agents be better prepared. I do that two ways. I try to give some good advice here. It's hard to remember it all. It's even harder to listen, right? In fact, I'm in the business, get this, I tell people all the time, I'm in the business of getting paid to give advice. You imagine? People give me money for advice. Today, I'm giving free advice. <laughs> even, even when I get paid for advice, people ignore me. When I was young, I used to get annoyed by that. I'd be like, these people don't listen to me. I just told them that this was happening. And now, now I'm delighted. Now I'm like, ignore me by all means. Because when you go out there and exactly what I told you happens to you, now you come back and think I walk on water. Rich, guess what? I know. Tell me. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'm like, no way. They're like, yeah, what do I got to do? You got to come back. <laughs> now the check's bigger, right? So, so I love when people don't listen. So if you listen today, I think that's a good idea, okay? So I, I try to help agents be better two ways. One, I give free advice. Two, I then offer to give more free advice. <laughs> because the people that work with me, they get my cell, they get my assistant, Monique's back there cell. Monique and I have been together for 12 years. We're gonna together for 12 years. By the way, I've been married for 20 years to a woman that is by far my superior. In fact, when people see us out together, they assume I have money. <laughs> right? Like, that's what they're whispering. They're saying something like that. There's got to be some explanation. Right? They're like, it's got to have money. And it's like, it's not true because I've been with her for 20 years. Right? I was starving when I met her. So she's just foolish. But I see that trick. So, so I've been with her 20 years. But I tell my wife all the time, I go, if Monique insisted matrimony, I, we'd be Mormon. Okay? Because she's that good. In my office, I'm blessed. My staff is the best. Okay, so when you work with, with a guy like me, you get to talk to me, so you get more free advice. And here's why I give more free advice, because I'd rather avoid the mistake. Avoid the mistake. And so agents that work with me, they routinely will call and they'll say, hey, I got this issue. I'm looking to prepare an addendum. And I'm like, no, 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 no. don't help me. Don't help me. If you want to take a crack at it, go ahead, but please don't forward it. Send it to me first. I'll take a look at it. Wherever I am, usually, come hell or high water, someone in my office responds. Why? Because I much prefer that things get done correctly. And here's what happened. The, the smart agent, the agent that feels that they're going to be in this business for a long time, they take advantage of technology, right? Because we're not reinventing the wheel here. We know the addendums we're going to see. Every now and again, you're going to have to write an addendum about the seller needing an extra month to remove his giraffe cage from a backyard in Miami, right? Or his gallinero or something. Every now and again, there's going to be a weird addendum to write up. But more often than not, it's going to be, we're agreeing to extend the closing date, but we're extending the inspection period, but not the closing date. You know, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to provide credits. And there's just a way to write it. And get, here's, 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 the, here's the news flash. I didn't make it up. Can you imagine? My business is the business that rewards plagiarism. Okay? So it's just 15 years of my working on absorbing and refining the simplest possible clauses. The absolute best way to write things so that there is no ambiguity. Ambiguity is the source of litigation. Okay, so the poorly written addendum, the person who doesn't understand remedies, this is what creates deals that die. Okay, so the first and primary reason why deals die is because agents are unprepared. And here's what I mean by that. So now, what is the most common transactional document we use in residential real property sales? The as is, right? Okay, so who here, let's be honest, right? We're all, we're in the huddle. Who here has read the as is one end to the other? Yes. Okay, so, so surprisingly though, not everyone in the room raised their hand, right? But we just agreed everyone in the room is a real estate professional, okay? So now imagine going to the doctor for the first time, new doctor. Doc, how are you? Oh, I'm good. Doc, have you read 
Like Medicine 101? <laughs> like whatever the most basic, the most commonly used, we just agreed it was the as is. Like, so I don't know what it is in medicine, but let's, let's call it medicine. Have you read it? And at this point, if you didn't raise your hand, you are faced with what the Americans call what? A fork in the road, right? You're either going to lie to your patient or client and say, of course, right? Which I think I've read somewhere that's starting out on the wrong foot, right? Or you're going to tell the truth, right? Which in this case is also not good, right? Usually honesty is the best policy. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know here, right? So if you say no, if you're the patient now, are you staying? No? Hey, you're launching that app. The one that calls you, you're like hitting the button in your pocket. You're taking a call. Oh, wait, doc. doc, doc, doc. And you're never coming back. Right? So, so the first thing that we owe ourselves is the commitment to ourselves to be prepared. You want to know why? Because it is embarrassing to not be prepared. Guy like me, I'm terrified about not being prepared. Ask Jesus, he'll tell you, I'm the most insufferable person in the world. He has like a journal that he keeps for like the times that I've been wrong. Like we joke about it, I'm wrong all the time. Have you but, admitted you've been wrong? Right, the times that I've admitted I've been wrong. <laughs> so listen, a guy like me, nothing scares me more like not being prepared, okay? That terrifies me. So I don't understand how you're in the business and you're out there, like you have the nerve to be out there and not have read the contract. I don't get it. Because I would be terrified to go into court to represent my client and not be prepared to discuss like the material, to not know the framework for the deal. Okay, and here's how I know that people are not prepared. Let me give you a good example, okay? It's all in the question. So when I get a call from an agent who's got a listing and the agent says, the seller wants to know what closing costs they're going to pay. <clears throat> okay, because you know the seller wants the net. So you'll run into all these other Mickey Mouse lawyers and title company to tell you they have a software where you can do your seller net sheet and it'll come out with your logo on all that bullshit. Listen, that doesn't, it's BS. Number one, you don't know what your data, put, what data you're putting in there. You don't know about tax and probations. And by the way, you're not charged with that knowledge. Okay, I don't want you to know about that. I want you to know about how to sell, about the, what the community has, what the association fees are, what the application fee is. Things that when a prospective buyer goes there is going to feel romanced by your superior knowledge of the product. Okay, your job is not to know what the tax prorations are going to be. So all that cuento camino, those, those Chinese stories as the Cubans call them, or those little gizmos, they're gizmos, guys. They're gadgets. Okay, that's not how this business is done. This business is done with performance, commitment, understanding, and intelligence. Okay, that's the way it works. So when you ask me, what are the closing costs a seller pays? I know that you haven't read the contract. You wanna know why? Because there is an entire section devoted to itemizing on a per party basis what they're going to pay. Mm -hmm. On a per party basis, it tells you because closing costs, they have two considerations. The first is the category, the kind of closing cost at issue. The second is the amount, the amount of the closing cost. So everyone here, if you have a cell phone, let me see real quick. Don't, don't, yeah, don't stress. If you have an iPhone, right, like me, okay. Who gets the iPhone and you take it out of the box and when you turn it on, there's like that photo. The first iPhones, it had a planet. Anybody remember like the planet Earth? It was like a black screen and the Earth was on it. Now you get a flower, whatever else, okay? What do we call, and, and by the way, if you turn on your phone and somebody, right out of the box, and somebody calls you, it's gonna ring a certain way, right? Like when the phones became modern, it was like doo -doo 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 right? And then you can go in and change all that, okay? What do we call the settings that the phone is at when you bring them out of the box. The default. The default settings. Most people are shocked to know that default settings exist in places other than cell phones. 
They're like, no shit. And it's like, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. In fact, most people don't know that cell phones borrowed the term default settings from all the prior uses of default settings and not vice versa. Okay, so the as-is contract, the vacant land contract, the commercial contract, the super contract, all the contracts are filled with default settings. In fact, most offers that agents submit keep the default settings. It's, a, it's the rare agent that goes through and like changes the default settings. So let me give you a good example of a default setting where like the deposit says, you know, uh, the amount of, you know, you're gonna make a deposit either contemporaneously with the signing of the contract or within blank number of days. And then there's a parentheses that says, if left blank within three days. When you leave it blank, you have opted for the default. Agree? Okay. So now that we understand this concept of the default, we can understand how silly the question of what costs will the seller pay is. You wanna know why? Because by default, they are defined. By default, they are in section nine of the as-is contract, which governs closing costs. And it tells you, the seller shall pay A, B, and C, right? So um, that's an oversimplification, but it'll say, if this, the seller pays X, if not, the seller pays this, right? But there are default settings. Then on the buyer side, it tells you X, Y, Z. And here's what I tell everybody else about the beauty of real estate and transactional <coughs> work in general, which is that by agreement, we can do whatever we want. We can do whatever we want. So if, I'm, if I have time and I'm feeling salty, when I get that question, I'll say, well, <laughs> what have they agreed to pay? And they're like, well, what do you mean? And I'm like, yeah, because by agreement, we can do whatever we want. Maybe the seller is selling the Taj Mahal. Mm -hmm. And the guy says, if you want to buy the Taj Mahal, you pay all the seller closing costs, baby. I, I mean, it's that easy. I want to pay nothing. You like my price, you buy my property. If not, no problem. Oh, no, 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 there's no agreement. They haven't even talked about it. I go, oh, they haven't even talked about it. Okay, so, with, so in other words, you, I, you must be asking me what sellers typically pay. Right? That's a completely different question. And if you're asking me what sellers typically pay, you're wasting your time. But what is infinitely worse is that you are wasting my time. Because the answer is in your hand. It's in the as-is contract that you haven't read. By the way, it's a good thing that you've only asked me this question. Because I, I will keep it a secret. That's right. That's right, I will keep your secret. That you obviously don't have any fucking idea what you're doing. Your secret is safe with me. You're with me, your secret is safe. I'm gonna teach you. I'm gonna teach you so that you never ask this question again. Right? For free, I'm gonna point it out. I'm gonna show you where it is, and then you know never to ask this question again. Because what you told me is that, and listen, no one is born knowing, okay? No one's born knowing, let's be real. Well, what you're telling me is that you don't care to prepare and you don't realize that you could be making mistakes. You're a danger, you're a loose cannon, okay? You're, you're a loaded gun, a, you could blow someone's toe off at any moment, okay? Because, you know, I tell people all the time, you know why birds land on power lines? You ever notice that you've seen birds and they land on power lines? You want to know why they do that? Because they don't know their power lines. <laughs> right? Because if you were a bird, I mean, even if you know, oh, as long as I'm not touching the ground, it doesn't matter, right? You just fly another five feet to a branch. Right? Like, if you knew that it was a power line, you just wouldn't land on the power line. There's a million better places to land, but they don't know. They're like, oh, look at this rope. Right? So, so that's why birds land on power lines. That's why agents ask questions like that. That's why they go into deals unprepared, because you don't realize you're working with live wires. You don't realize it until you get shocked. 
And then it's a problem. It's someone else's money. And by the way, this is 2019. We're about to be in 2020. You know what that means? It's cancel culture, baby. It's always somebody's fault. Okay? No one loses nowadays. And it's like, no, we lost. Hey, we gave it a great shot. Thank you so much. You helped me. It's We got a babysitter. Trust me, your client is your client is everything's good until it's good, and then as soon as a, a while it's good, and then as soon as it's bad, trust me, it's bad. Yeah. Okay, and that's why loyalty is such an important thing because you work with it. You'll find professionals that when a mistake is made, they're quick to point blame. Okay, that's another thing. You want a guy like that? Don't call me. I hate that. Okay, I hate that. When the mess is made, we have to solve the problem. That's right. Okay, that's our job. Solve the problem. We'll talk about it later. Okay, because the buyer and the seller, okay, these people are not repeat customers. Most humans buy and sell real property mm, once, twice, three, four times, right? It needs momentous occasions. If, for example, if you and I in this room, if we were dependent on people like my late grandmother, Minerva, mm -hmm. she was this big, she was like a, like a Napoleon on wheels, a firebrand old Cuban lady. She lived in the same house from the minute she got here from Cuba till like she died in that house. So if we had to depend on someone like that to drive our market, we'd start. Okay, but most people buy and sell only two or three times. So to them, it's a massive deal. So imagine you are working for people who they only do this two or three times ever. It's like a parachute trainer when they take people flying. Okay, imagine if you're, you're a parachute guy and you don't know how to pull a chute, okay, because that's like not reading the contract. You're going to take people jumping with you. Right? That's what we're talking about here, guys. Biggest investment of people's lives. So we owe it to ourselves and to them to be prepared. Okay, so you ever read the contract, go home tonight, yeah. take it with you, and read it. And by the way, it's boring. It's, like, <laughs> it's horrible. It's like stereo instructions. Let's be clear, right? I mean, I'm not suggesting it's a, it's a page turner, right? And by the way, you don't have to memorize it. You just have to have a general familiarity with the sections. You know what they, we used to do in school? Like, here's what I do about documents like that. I take the document, and I'd like, just read the big words. Yeah. Right? Like the headings, like the headlines. Like a lot like people read newspapers. Okay? People read headlines and then like they think they read the newspaper, but they didn't. Okay? So it's like I'm my assistant. I have an assistant in my office. Another one's like, have you seen this movie? She's like, no, but I've seen the preview. <laughs> and, and she swears that she's seen the movie. I'm like, no. Um, uh, I'm like, never. No, it's not her. So, so, you know, do yourselves that favor. And by the way, take it into the restroom with you without your phone. Uh, that's a trick. That's a trick. If that's a good place to read it in the restroom because it, you know when you forget your phone, you reach for like the freshener, right? And you're reading it and you're like triglyceride, triglyceride. Just bring the contract with you. Be a little bit better. You just knock it out a couple pages at a time. Okay, so literally take it and outline it. A good trick. Just take it and write the section headers down. So section one is going to be the parties, right? You know you always got the parties in the middle there. The first page you have the price. Right, the deposit information, the deadline to accept my offer, the closing date down at the bottom of page four. Just draw some lines, you know, and then just know closing date so that in your mind now you know how to look. You want to know why? Because appearances matter. So when you're with people too and they want to know where something is in the contract, pretty powerful. That guy that's like, it's in here. It's in here. God damn it. I, it's in, I know it's here. Right, so you, when you know section 9, closing cost, section 12, as for procedure, right? These kind of things, it inspires confidence. Okay, people that, that, that they're involved in something big, they want to feel confident. They want to feel like you're going to take them to the promised land. Okay, and so that's a big part of the concept of preparation. All right, now another big part of the concept of preparation is a little harder. Okay, comes from experience. Okay, and as there's an old saying that says, Experience comes from, oh, actually, good judgment comes from experience. And experience, well, that comes from bad judgment, right? So, so it's a great phrase, and unfortunately, it's true. My old man, he used to say that experience always shows up late. Okay, by the time you figure it out, you don't need it anymore. 
<laughs> so, so, so I just, he was a pessimist. <laughs> the glass half empty guy. So I like to think you get him for the next time, you know, for the next time. So, so here's the trick in terms of once a deal is in trouble, how do we become part of the solution instead of the problem? We as agents, okay? You guys are the key. Here's why. Typically, the parties are going to have a better relationship with you than with my office, okay? A couple reasons for that. Number one, somehow, some way they got to you. You sold their cousin's house, you are their cousin, um, <coughs> you met them somewhere, uh, they, you sold the neighbor, something, okay? Me, they usually come into the deal ordinarily because mere mortals, as I call them, don't already have real estate lawyers at the ready, right? Most people buying 200, 300, 400, 500, 600 thousand dollar houses just don't know enough about the process to say, I'm gonna use Keller Williams, Real Estate Empire, Compass, this and that, like select, and then say my closing agent's gonna be X, Y, Z. Okay, most people land with an agent through whatever reason, Okay, and then the agent drives the ship in terms of here's our closer, here's our mortgage people, right? That's why people chase you guys. So you have to learn to know the remedy when a problem arises. Okay, so let's take a situation. We're already in contract. Who's got the time? Mo? Um, 11.30. Okay, we're halfway, perfect. So. Now we're at the, when we have a deal, we're in contract, and the deal is in trouble for whatever reason, how do we avoid the death of the deal? Okay. The art is in knowing the remedy. What do I mean by that? Okay. Law, not unlike medicine, is a field where problems are usually associated with a certain remedy, okay? You don't just show up at the hospital, for example, with an earache and leave with a neck brace, typically, <laughs> right? Because a neck brace is not the remedy for an ear infection. An ear infection needs to be treated with drops, Right? Or maybe they go in with the tongs and take out that red bean that the kids develop, right? You see that? She's laughing because she's like, yeah, I know my son had a big red bean. I had it with me. So, so you know, the, right? Or they need the two weedles, right? The, the, that's, cute. that's Cuban for the tubes. They use little tubes in the ears, right? So that's the remedy for an ear infection, okay? So when you, and by the way, if you notice, when people get sick, myself included, and we go to the doctor, we don't question the doctor about the remedy too much, right? Like, and when, and when the doctor does give you the medicine, you don't typically demand an explanation about how the medicine works in the body, right? So it's like the doctor, you know, you have an infection and they give you like, you know, Leviquin is a common antibiotic, right? It's a broad spectrum. You're like, Leviquin, why Leviquin? And you don't hustle the doctor for, well, Leviquin's broad spectrum and what happens is that it's gonna attach to your T cells and you know, like they don't do that. But as soon as you get around a lawyer, People want to know, and people want to tell you what the solution is. They want to tell you how to do it. So it's unbelievable. So, so my brother Oscar, this is being filmed, this is great. He's my idol in life. Jesus knows him as well, okay? He's 60 plus years old. He's much older than me. He's wildly successful. Wildly. Multi-millionaire developer. His daughter's a beautiful clothing designer. My niece, like, like you read about. My nephew is also beautiful. He married a Victoria's <laughs> Secret model with the wings. Like a real life Victoria's Secret model with the wings, right? I mean, these people got the bounce in life, okay? And so my brother Oscar, one day he calls me fired up and I used to want his work. I used to want to be his lawyer, okay? But as the Chinese say, you gotta be careful what you wish for, okay? So one day my brother calls me and he says, Richard, I have a problem. I need you to call Camilo right now. And I knew right away who he was talking about. Who remembers Camilo Furniture? Oh, Camilo yeah. Furniture of, of the Palmetto? Yeah, he yeah. sold. Camilo oh, sold wow. to the people that bought all those warehouses. Yeah. Camilo Furniture was a big name in furniture in Miami. He had a huge warehouse right off the Palmetto, right before uh, Bird Road. On the right, it was a massive big red egg there, Camilo, Camilo Furniture, right? 
And my brother had ordered some custom furniture from Camilo for his new sales office. He's a developer. In fact, you get, uh, Jesus is about to get some of his houses. So, so he's a developer, and uh, it was his, he was launching his new sales office, and this is in the run-up. Okay, so this is in the time when you open, and people were there for pre-construction contracts, kicking the doors down. Okay, so he was sure to sell houses. Okay, let's be clear. So he calls me. He says, "Richard, I need you to get on the phone, Camilo, right now, because the furniture he promised me, custom furniture, it's not here. It needed to be here today. This is a Thursday. It needed to be here today. He just told me it's not going to be here until next week, and I'm not going to be able to open on Saturday. And I need you to write him a letter, tell him I'm going to come after him for what I paid for the furniture, plus." All the millions of dollars I'm not going to make selling real estate this week because my office isn't ready. <laughs> now, my brother is the Darth Vader of my existence. <laughs> Disagreeing with him. <laughs> it makes me sweat. Like just thinking about having to tell him, makes me sweat so i was trying to illustrate i'm like uh i can't we can't i mean we can send a letter <laughs> we can't say this all this thing about the multi-millions and he's like oh what do you mean because i'm not gonna be able to like oh, well oscar let me ask you this what are you paying for the furniture he says eighty thousand yeah. bucks i said yeah i know for like a little little sales center too okay eighty thousand bucks and i said okay what do you think camilo's margin is on the 80,000, right? Like that's total, right? That's what you're giving him. He's like, yeah, so obviously he's got cost in there. What do you think his margin is? He says, I don't know, 40,000. I go, okay. So when you bought the stuff from Camilo, did you, did you have a little contract? He's like, I got a little PO, I got a purchase order. I'm like, okay, does the PO say anywhere? Like, did you tell Camilo, hey Camilo, you better make sure that I have this furniture on time because if I can't open, I can't sell. And if I can't sell, I'm gonna sue you. He said, no, I, why would I say that? I go, well, Oscar, because if I'm selling you furniture and you tell me that if I don't deliver in time, you're going to come after me for millions of dollars, I might want my margin to be a little more than $40,000, right? Because to take on a multi-million dollar risk, I need more than $40,000, right? And, be, and I was trying to illustrate, get this, that he couldn't call me and tell me what to do. He can but once I tell him why, or that we can't do it, his questioning me is gonna put me in, I have to explain something to you that I went to school to learn. And by the way, I spent money through the nose on. And here's the burning principle of law on this that you don't need to know. In contract, in the law of contract, damages must have been foreseeable foreseeable at the time of the formation of the agreement, right? Doesn't the law sound so nice when you talk to somebody who knows it, like it makes sense. Like the parties had to have some imagination about their potential exposure so that we could be sure that they agreed to take on that responsibility. You follow? Like that's the way it works when later on you're in front of the judge and Oscar Barber is there with his lawyer talking about how Camilo owes me three million bucks and Camilo's like, dude, I was trying to sell. <laughs> I was selling four desks and I think my factory was late. It's Miami. You know what I mean? And by the way, I was four days late and people get there walking me on a Does that sound normal to you? Does that sound normal? No. And so here's what happens. Here's why we can't make a deal with Camilo when we start that way. Because be, since we don't know the remedy, and by the way, I told my brother, it's the day I grew up with him. I go, Oscar, there is a guy out there who will write this letter for you. Okay? Because there's a guy out there that right now needs the fee more than he needs to enlighten his client. Okay? There's a guy who needs the fee more than he needs to help his client get to where his client needs to be. What do you really want, Oscar? Right? Because... Because the question is, we got to figure out what we really want so then we can assess whether or not what you're suggesting will help us get closer to what we want or further from what we want. Okay? So we first have to know the remedy. So I don't expect you guys to know the law of contract, my brother, but don't tell me why. Don't be like, why can't we do that? It's like, bro, do, do I tell you how to build the house? You imagine I get to the site and I'm like, why are you putting the rebar before the concrete? <laughs> You'd be like, I have to explain that to you? I'm the builder. 
right? So, so we, we, you know, we got to stick to what we know. But you have to understand some basic concepts of contract because you work with contracts. You don't have to be contract lawyers, but you got to know a little bit about contracts. Okay? So let me give you some concepts about contracts that will help you save deals. The first is, in contracts, when we talk about breaches, right, that's what, how problems arise. Someone's doing or not doing something in violation of what we agreed earlier, right? Okay. There are two kinds of breaches, typically. There are what we call material breaches, and then there are immaterial breaches. Realtors, as a general premise, assume that every breach is material. And worse, so do the parties. So I'll give you an example. I had a guy, calls me three weeks ago or so. He's an agent known the guy since high school so I can be a little bit more blunt with him and by the way he's like born here from here full-blooded here did first second third primary education here like has no excuse okay for not like reading you know I, people who like, I tell people all the time if I had to take the bar exam in Spanish, and guys, I speak excellent Spanish. I read it, I write it, I have accents, the punctuation, all that. If I had to take the bar exam in Spanish, you could fail me. Okay, because it's a whole language. You gotta, when I went to law school, the first year was learning a language. Okay, so I, I really admire people who go to another country, pick up the language, and then have to read contracts. Okay, so if you're from here, born here, study here, all that, and you're not reading the contract, you're really pissing me off. Okay, so, yeah, I mean, it's out of hand. So, this guy calls me. And it's walkthrough time. And he says, hey man, we got a problem. And I go, do tell. <laughs> and he goes, well, we went, through the, we went through the walkthrough and they took the fridge. I said, they took the fridge. <laughs> That's a disaster. What do you want to do? <laughs> and he says, no, my guy says he's not closing. I go, he's not? Okay, well, um... All right, uh, so why are you calling me? He goes, no, I just want to know what you think about that. I go, well, what do you think about it? He goes, well, I think, you know, listen, they can't take the refrigerator, but they either got to bring it back or we don't close. I go, that's great advice. Have you told the guy that yet? He goes, no, 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 I was calling you first. I'm like, good, good boy. Nice. Good, good. You're a lot smarter than you look. Yeah, 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 that's good. You're a lot smarter than you look. Don't give bad advice. Because let me explain. How much is the purchase price? Oh, it's 585 grand. And, and the guy says, and the guy says, why don't you know about this? Right? And so I love when agents ask me that. Because agents, people, and I, I mean this, you want to feel like every file, the lawyer's aware of it. But let me let you in a little secret. If I'm unaware of your file, that's good for you. That's good for you. That means everything is proceeding according to plan. Right? Because when it comes to me, I have to unscrew something. Right? I'll be honest with you. I was telling somebody yesterday, I don't know how to turn on my closer software. I have no idea how to do it. If you ask me to prepare a HUD, right? You put a gun to my head right now and say, oh yeah, make a CD. Shoot, fire. Okay? I don't know how to make CDs. I know the law. I know how to get business. I know how to solve the problems. Okay? So I don't know how to make CDs, but I do know the law. And so I said, listen, it's a $585,000 purchase price. What do you suppose a new fridge costs? It says $1,800. Bucks. Said, okay, imagine the pizza pie of this problem. Oh my God. <laughs> so let's take this problem and let's turn it into a pizza pie. Do you think that for $1,800 you get to cancel $595? Is that what you think? And, and, and listen, we haven't even gone to the contract yet. Okay, do you know why? Do you know why we haven't gone to the contract yet? Because I want everyone to know what they tell us the first week of law school, I swear to you, in every law school across the country. Don't check your common sense at the door. Okay, you guys should be lawyers now, you think you're overanalyzed everything, that's all bullshit. Don't check your common sense at the door. Do you think that you can get to the end, that you can take a bank, a buyer, a seller, agent, you could bring everybody to the end, and because the fridge is missing, you're not going to close? <laughs> I mean, que falta respeto, bro, I've been working for two months. What the fuck do you mean? Just be like, hey, can you buy a fridge? Because I'll consider it. <laughs> right? I mean, so 
So first, don't check your common sense at the door. Then, then, before calling anyone with a stupid question, I want you to ask the default question. Have I checked the contractor? Have I gone back to take a peek to see if the people who get paid every year to sit in a little room congratulate themselves about being masters of the universe or revise the form that they've been working on since before any of you even thought about going into real estate? Do you think that that document might contemplate this precise situation? Is it possible that in all the history of real estate sold in Miami, someone might have previously taken the fridge the day of the walkthrough? Or do we think this is the first time? Right? It's probably happened before, right? Okay, let's check the contract. You will find that the, there's a provision in there called the seller's duty to maintain. Okay? And it says that the seller has a duty to maintain the property in not exactly the same. So don't get crazy. Don't get crazy. In substantially the same condition as it was at the time of contract. Substantially the same provision. Why? Because if I have a three-year-old girl, baby girl like I do, and you come to buy my house in December and we close in February, I guarantee you one or two crayons are gonna hit the living room, okay, from here to next month. I mean, you can rest assured that there will, it will not be the precise same house it was in December, in February, but it's gonna be substantially the same. And a missing fridge, you know what, is redressable. So my friend, since he's known me, he can also be disrespectful. So he's like, no, what you're telling me is that the guy can do whatever he wants. <laughs> How many times have you heard of that? No, you're telling me the guy can do whatever he wants. I go, no, man, that's not what I said. Let me tell you what the remedy is. You're going to go to the walkthrough, take an iPad, you're going to jot down everything that you feel is a deviation, a failure to maintain the property in the substantially same condition that it's in. And then you're gonna call me, you're gonna send me a list, and I <coughs> am going to send a demand before we close, because aside from closing agent, I'm also this buyer's lawyer, and I'm gonna say, Fulano, to the seller's lawyer, who by the way is my friend, and I'm gonna say, Fulanito, just wanna bring to your attention that after the walkthrough, we found out that X, Y, and Z issues are in disrepair, missing, stolen, in violation of section X. We're happy to resolve it now. If you want to give us a little credit for this problem, we'll adjust the closing statement. If not, just be advised that my client may or may not decide to pursue his claim thereafter because the law in the United States prefers to give money damages as its primary remedy. That's what we do. If we can solve your problem with a check, that's what we go with, okay? That's our that's what that's what we call a remedy at law. So, if the seller's lawyer gets my email, okay? And by the way, this is what he did. Gets my email cuz when I told my buddy that, he's like, "Okay, great idea. This is why I called you, bro. Don't be an asshole. Just tell me this is how we're going to take care of it and do it." No, 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 man. I'm not being an asshole. I'm trying to help. Well, I am being an asshole. I'm trying to help. You. Okay? Because I want you to know you're being an asshole, bro. And if I sent you a bill for all the time that you waste of my life with these stupid questions, you know what I'm saying? Trust me, I'll be up. Okay? So, so this is a dear friend of mine, right? So we have this discussion. I send the email, and the seller's lawyer does exactly what I anticipated that he was doing. He's like, guy's been around a long time. He gets my email, and he doesn't reply to my email. He calls me. He goes, hey, bro, who's your client on this file? <laughs> and I go, man, come on, Tom. It's not the client. Bro. I got this agent. The guy wants to act like to his client. He's this fucking superhero, bro. And imagine the, the goddamn refrigerator. Right there. He's like, did you see that refrigerator? was nasty. I'm like, I know, man. Listen, they want to win. He goes, yeah, bro, they want to win. You tell them I say this. I, number one, I dare him not to close. Okay, because I already have a backup offer. That's number one. Number two, if they do close, I dare them to file a lawsuit, bro. And I mean, you can laugh and we can make money because by the end of the day, what's it worth, bro? 2,500 bucks, a new refrigerator. It's not, who's going to go lawyer up for 2,500 bucks, guy? Now, again, it's not that the guy, so it's not he's right. I can do whatever I want. It's no, 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 no. Listen, I told my guy, I, I, I laughed. I go, Tom, that's, that might fly with this guy. He's a French guy. He doesn't really give a shit. I think the agent's making more of a... Thing about it here, if it were my dad, we'd chase you to the end of time. <laughs> I just want you to know. He goes, yeah, bro, I know. He's like, well, we gotta pick our spots. I go, yeah, because my old man was a principal guy. That and there's fee recovery. So that's the beauty of these contracts too. By the way, you are not disincentivized from chasing $2,500 because if you prevail, 
in a dispute related to the contract, the prevailing party will be entitled to attorney's fees. Doesn't mean you get to recover it, right? That's the other thing people don't understand. They're like, well, can I win? And I'm like, yeah, can we define win? What does win mean? We go to court and the judge says, you win, I give you a little papelito. <laughs> and they're like, I don't get paid? And they're like, you might, but you gotta go get a guy, another guy to go chase the money. And he's like, no, they don't pay that day. I go, yes, but I forgot the judge hits the button and a pile of money falls out of the sky. You haven't heard? And they're like, oh, I mean, and it's like, I know, baby, because it's not like it is on Scandal. You know what I mean? Like suits, scandal, fiction. It's fiction. That's why I don't watch lawyer shows, okay? So there's no such thing as justice at the courthouse, okay? I got a lawyer buddy of mine, he says that. You don't go down to the courthouse to find justice, okay? If you're looking for justice, you're in trouble, okay? So it costs money to pursue justice, right? The, the idea of justice. And so what's much better? Solving the problem. Solving the problem. Okay, so of course, I had to get on the phone with the guy. He was like, Rich, I do not understand. In France, you cannot whip out the, the, the refrigerator and the door of the closing. You cannot do that. The gendarme will come to the house immediately. And I'm like, I know, man. And that's why people got on boats. <laughs> Literally, at a time, bro, where they didn't have GPS, right? They got on boats in the middle of the night and they sailed to nowhere. They didn't even know there was anything over here. That's how bad they don't want they, that. So that's why we don't do it like that over there. Here, you know, bro, you can sue after and whatever. And he's like, no, 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 no. no. Get it. Let's just close my wife wants to close. Yeah. <laughs> said, ah, no, perfect, no problem. So of course we get to the end and this and that's not a great example of working through a remedy. It's just a great example of talking people off the ledge. Okay, which is what we have to do a lot of times. Why? Because these people are emotional, right? Especially the wives. You know, wives are emotional, they got their trucks packed up, they want to close, you know, I gotta move on Friday. You know, and then you get to my office, like, I don't have funds. And they're like, what are you, what, what, what does that mean? They don't even know what that means, they just know it sounds bad. Okay? <laughs> like, Javi, no he money. just, <laughs> They just want to move out, right? You see what I mean? So it's very hard. You got to learn to talk people off the ledge. Now, I'll give you a better remedy example, okay? A better remedy example, okay? So now, remember, material versus immaterial breaches, okay? So step one, when you, have, when you encounter a situation in a file where someone is starting to misbehave, we need to first... <laughs> Check the contract to see if this concept is contemplated, okay? Then two, then we need to ask ourselves, material breach or immaterial breach, okay? Once we make that determination, we're in a better position to manage our client's expectations. That's the true art of being an effective agent is managing the client's expectations. Right? And I'll give you a great example of this. I was deathly afraid of flying. Deathly afraid of flying. I'd have to get on an airplane. I swear to you, for two weeks prior to the flight, I would cry myself to sleep. I swear to you. I swear to you. Then in 2010, my wife, who was then 30, she got cancer. Okay? Thank God we're very blessed, bro. I don't mean that as a bummer. We're very blessed. It's good. She's healthy. We have a baby now. Everything's, everything's fantastic. But... I realized after that that being afraid of flying didn't make much sense. Like, I really learned fear then when the doctor was like, hey, she might die this week. And like, I was like, oh, this airplane shit is nothing. <laughs> but, 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 but I was then talking to a pilot, right? A buddy of mine who's a pilot. He's been a private pilot all his life. He's flown for the Cisneros family. He's flown George Bush. He's flown jets, G5, G6, you name it. He's a very good private pilot. And one day I was talking to him about being afraid of airplanes and then after my wife wasn't sick anymore I, I not only did I not want to be afraid of airplanes I wanted to be in airplanes more and so I, I had got some work in the Bahamas Jesus went with me to that job in the Bahamas and we would fly on this little plane that the company owned and so I learned a lot about those planes Jesus by the way is a pilot it's really badass guy and my dad was a pilot so my dad loved Jesus for that guy taught himself to fly, bought himself a little airplane to fly to his office. I, I rarely compliment him, but that was cool. So I told him, I mean, listen, I wouldn't get in a plane with you, not even if the world were flooded with urine. Okay? But not even then would I get in a plane with you, Jesus, but I give, I gotta give it to him. So anyway, I wanted to learn a lot about the planes, and this guy Johnny says to me, the pilot, he says to me, he goes, you know what, we routinely have uncomfortable situations during flights, routinely. But 
the passengers never know. So, you know, it's our objective to get them on the ground. Like, they don't have to know what we're going through. Right. Okay? And that's our job. Hey, our job is... Our job is to make sure people have a smooth flight. And that stuck with me. Our job is to make sure people have Amen. a smooth flight. Okay? And that's our job in this business, guys. Right. That's our job in this business. So, so you got to know how to manage the expectation. So if with every little hassle, you're running back to the client, you're sending off, you're firing off a me email, the classic email that copies everyone. And then you're starting to tell people what they haven't done in order and shit. Nobody likes that person. Okay? That's the person in school that, that like ratted out her group people. You know, like, like, I was a little bit of a delinquent, so, like, I would kind of lean on the, the group. Like, I'd get there, like, late and shit, and, like, there's always one girl, she's like, you're not copying my work, okay? And it's like, relax, Sally. Jesus. You're going to pass? You know, so, so, you know, so, like, so nobody likes that person that tattles on anybody else. So you got to be part of the solution, okay? And I mean that less jokingly. you got to be part of the solution from the beginning, okay? you got to learn when to sound the alarm. And most often the answer is we don't sound the alarm, okay? It's just like with our kids. We suffer our stresses ourselves to insulate our kids. Our clients are a lot like our kids. I realized the other day I gave, did not give my dad sufficient credit in this life. It bothers me all the time. He's not here now. But one day, I remember recently, I remember recently that one day, like the lights went off in my house. And I was, I got scared and this and that, and we turned it into this whole camping shit. We made eggs outside on like a thing, and like he had this trick he showed me where he took like a sterno and he put a, uh, he put a, you know, he, he emptied a little sterno can, he put on a little two by four of wood, he, he put a nail in it, and then he put a, a, a cotton ball in it, and then he put rubbing alcohol in it, and he threw a match, and it was like a stove, and he had a little thing, and he made an egg, and I thought it was the coolest thing, says ice cream, okay? <laughs> and I realize now that the power got cut, okay? The power got cut, because he didn't have the money to pay the power. This might have been 1982, he was in the airplane business, there was a recession in 82, Jimmy Carter, people like yourself, right, might remember, okay, and there was a fuel issue, fuel was very expensive at the time, and so you couldn't sell airplanes, and we didn't have power, okay, but he didn't come into my room and tell me, hey son, the electricity's off, so just relax, this is what happens when camping in the pool. No, he was like, fuck, let's go camping and make eggs, you know, and, and, and 30 years later, I realized he was just saving me from a bad time. And a little kid, he's not going to understand. Okay, just like your client's not going to understand what it means that the association approval is not going to come through in time. Okay, or that they don't have the estoppel yet. You say estoppel to a Cuban and they're thinking stop sign. <laughs> right? No, we don't have the estoppel. Yet. Don't want to go on it. <laughs> So, so you gotta, you, you know, we, we can't, we have to know how to smother the grenade. We have to know how to make sure our people have a smooth flight. So remember, we gotta go through these checks. That's what pilots do, guys. That's what pilots do. When they have a problem and the plane starts rattling, they grab their book and shit. Have you ever noticed that? And they're like checking and they're like, do you have, do we have surface of pressure? And the guy next to him's like, ch -ch -ch -ch. and he's like, do we have this? And he's like shaking, he's putting the book back. You know, it's like, if they panicked, we'd all be in the fucking mountainside, right? So, so you gotta think, I'm a pilot on this flight, okay? And I can't lose my cool, okay, at the first sight of rain. You know what I'm saying? I gotta, I gotta keep this plane flying, you know, smoothly, okay? So, so remember, Problem occurs, we assess the problem, we check the contract, right? Is it addressed in the contract? We determine, is it a material or an immaterial breach? And then step three is, we reassess the goals. Reassess our goals, why? Because it's true that the objective remains the same for the life of the mouth. They can't, the, the judge ordered that these people split the proceeds from the sale of the marital home, but only after they agreed and settled several identified credit card accounts that remained unpaid. And of course, it's the eve of closing, and we haven't even tried to negotiate the credit cards. Worse still, the seller, the ex-wife is very foreign, was not in the driver's seat of the transaction, and she does not know 
despite the black and white nature of section six of the contract, that she's got to move out at closing. <laughs> wait, 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 why are you guys laughing? That's not normal? Because I want you to fucking know she was pissed at me for suggesting that that was abnormal. She was like, what do you mean I gotta leave the day we close? I'm like, you mean the day the other guy gives you all the money? Why would you have to leave the day you get the money? I mean, I think I read it somewhere. First, I think I read it somewhere. Okay? That, I mean, but I might be wrong. Let me check. No, I'm right. Of course you gotta go, lady. I mean, are you serious? Then she's like, when we bought, we gave the seller two weeks time. I'm like, oh. Listen, no problem. I will call the other side. I'll say, hey, I don't know if you know, but this lady, when she bought, she gave me <laughs> So, I mean, we're just gonna have to chill here for a, little, for a little while longer. And of course, she wasn't getting it, but here's what I understood, knowing the remedy. Get this, it doesn't matter. She's gonna get her way. Okay, she's gonna get her way. You wanna know why? Because she only wants two weeks. She only wants two weeks to move out. The lawyer on the other side, luckily it was a lawyer, Lawyers have been doing this longer than me. I love lawyers that have been doing this longer than me because they first start by telling me what I gotta do. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta do this. She sent me an email, fired me right up. I replied, I was like, <sighs> I was like, madam. <laughs> so, so she gets on the phone, we get on the phone, and here was the long story short about this. Okay? She sent me an email where she says, you better make sure that the, buy the seller closes because the buyer is ready willing and able to close on time that's because she's setting the table bro she's bringing out her plate her spoons for the litigation she's setting up her specific performance lawsuit ready willing and able those are lawyer magic words and i said ready willing and able hey eh? like, let me tell you something i'm gonna let you in a little secret okay we're supposed to close this was on tuesday file was supposed to close yesterday i said listen we're supposed to close on tuesday i'm gonna make you a deal don't wait till friday to sue. I promise you that I'm not going to argue that you sued too early. <laughs> I promise you I'm going to waive. We call that ripeness. In the law is a lot like fruit. You can't sue me before the, the claim is ripe, okay? Just like don't eat the banana while it's green, okay? So I will waive ripeness. Send me a confirming email and I will accept service. You don't even have to chase my guy down. Sue today serve me tomorrow because by law i'm going to get 20 days to respond and i'm going to respond asking for more time <laughs> so before i even respond your client would have already waited six more days than my client is asking for today <laughs> okay so I know you know how this works. I just want to make sure you know that you're going to have to explain to your client why it's six days longer than the lady wanted to stay and we still haven't even heard from her. You know what I mean? And, and she says, but she's not entitled to do this. I said, I know that. I know that. What do you want me to do? Do you want your lady to sell and just wait two weeks for, or to buy and just wait two weeks for possession? Or do you want to sue my lady and wait 20 days for a response? Those are your choices. I don't have anything else for you. I'll get you the two weeks. <laughs> and the file closes. Now, now, here's the thing. Here's what's sad about that. The lady, she thinks that that's the way it is now. Right? Like, she didn't learn. She didn't learn anything. So, so she's out there, bro, and she's going to ruin someone's day next time. <laughs> okay? But, but guess what? And, and here's the other sad part about doing the right thing for your client. They don't get the benefit of seeing the movie of, like, how it would have been the other way. Okay? So, I'm telling you, that's the sad part of doing the right thing. God's irony. Happens to me all the time with my boss. I have a boss. I call him my daddy. We joke about it. Every time I, he, we get into a situation and I have to like settle and I you know get him to settle forever, he's like, we should have fought it, we should have done this, we should have done that, you know, you chickened out, and and I'm always like, no man, I'm pretty sure that we did the right thing, and you know I'm gonna go to sleep tonight knowing I did the right thing for you. You can be like, nah, you know, we should have gone for more, and that's that's the hubris of the defeated. Okay, so we're never gonna get past that. 
Okay, but your job is to make sure your clients have a smooth flight. To do that, you have to be prepared. Okay, and the last thing I'm gonna tell you is don't lie, fly straight. Don't cheat, don't cut corners. Don't do business with people who want kickbacks. Okay, and by the way, if you insist on kickbacks, I'm gonna give you this advice, free advice. Put every penny, every kickback penny you get, put it in a pillowcase. Because when the bubble bursts, you're gonna need it for criminal defense needs. Okay, I promise you. All right, see you guys. <laughs>Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of the Title Talk Podcast. If you haven't done so already, please make sure you subscribe to the show. This way you'll get future notifications of episodes as they become available. And if you feel so inclined, please leave us a review. We sure do appreciate it. Signing off from the Title Talk studio here in Coral Gables, Florida. We'll talk to you next time.